it's moga mine is omoga and so out of that phrase alone oma moga created an entire industry an entire industry that was in 1986 you would be shocked to know that oma moga died a pauper that notwithstanding the gentleman created an entire industry but because of his inability to identify what he had advanced not only in civilization but in governance oma muga could not take advantage of his creation in 1999 a kenyan is doing his masters degree in the us and while he's doing his masters degree he's writing his thesis and the thesis is on what the african continent can do because back then we were talking about millennium development goals and so this gentleman writes uh, his thesis just like most all of us in this forum we have done one academic project or the other and so by some sheer strike of luck the president the, the, the government in kenya changes hands and somehow his thesis find its way on president kibaki's desk president kibaki read it and then after reading the 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 the, the thesis believes in it convince cabinet and cabinet vote on that document and excuse me and they said the only thing we can change about this document is its title so they changed it from what africa and africa the continent of africa can do in realizing and actualizing the millennium development goals and the the government actually says can we just call this document vision 2030 so the vision 2030 we have today was actually extracted from a student's masters degree thesis more importantly this gentleman got himself a job as the secretary general of vision 2030 delivery team for a span of 10 years at the tail end of the 10 years this gentleman developed another flagship project from the uh, vision 2030 uh, document which was called the lake turkana green energy project and out of that the gentleman was in charge of 475 billion portfolio i'm going no, i'm not going to mention his name one person missed out on an opportunity that he had coined from his writing another person entirely out of awareness took advantage of that again i do a lot of public lectures at the universities and so i interact with a lot of academicians and people in academia and in one of the instances that i was doing this public lecture i in after after the presentation i was approached by a professor late uh, uh, at the twilight of his age and this professor asks me young man do you know if i had known you when i was beginning my career today i would be a billionaire and so i'm like thank you i'm very flattered son and he says no you don't understand the thing the reason why i say that is that when i was doing my masters degree in the us this gentleman is actually called the lightning man all over the world he's called the lightning man he's the first black man of black origin to go 50 kilometers above the earth to arrest lightning he's called the lightning man and this gentleman tells me when i was doing my master's thesis i designed something that up to date is being used by nasa nasa is the national aeronautics space Ad and 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 administration right and he says up to date every satellite uh, not not satellite every rocket that goes into space is fitted with the thing that i invented so that shows us how intellectual property happens to appear at different instances and the people that take advantage of intellectual property they tend to benefit and they tend to scale this professor never took advantage of anything actually now he's retired <laughs> he's retired 
this is my last example, and then we'll go to the notes. At, 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 at the turn of the 20th century, there's a gentleman called Napoleon Hill. And Napoleon Hill, prior to Napoleon Hill's book, groundbreaking book, the self-help space did not actually, was not even considered an industry. Napoleon Hill uh, embarked on a project of writing a book that took him 25 years. After that book was published, that book is actually being cre credited the world over for structuring the self-help industry. Everything and anyone that is participating in the self-help industry in one way or another can actually owes a debt of gratitude to Napoleon Hill. So let me ask, two people missed it, two people got it right. In as much as the story might, we might say that this one was a speech writer and this one was an engineer, this one was a scientist, that notwithstanding, all that I'm trying to actually sensitize us is that intellectual property rewards. And so welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Oguang Omuga and I'm the principal at Institute of Intangible Resource Awareness. And I will be taking us on the wealth that is in your book webinar. That is what I've structured this. In as much as the, 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 the webinar was tailored around the dormant wealth, I just want us to get straight into it that the wealth that is in your book, it doesn't matter whether you're aware of it or not, that wealth is there. <laughs> it will only do us good if we can just reach to tap into that wealth. And so thank you very much. This we uh, webinar is structured around sensitizing us as authors, not only to identify, but to take advantage of our diverse forms of intellectual property. Who we are, we are, we are a, an intellectual property advisory, consulting, research, valuation, and training firm in the African continent. But we always think of ourselves as we are the best in intellectual property, not only in the African continent, but in the world. And I will tell us why in a short while. <laughs> we exist to help individuals from all walks of life and organizations in whichever sector to identify the appearance of intellectual property. I want you to know that intellectual property makes appearance. Intellectual property might make appearance on you. Intellectual property might make appearance in the thing that you're doing and intellectual property makes appearance appearance in your environment, in your immediate environment. So at any given moment, whether you are aware of it or not, at any given moment, you have three layers of intellectual property. Whether you are, whether you've, you are aware of it or not, whether you're educated or not, whether you're skilled or not, whether you're good looking or not, whether you're tall or short, at the end of the day, all of us, we have three different layers of intellectual property. So housekeeping rules. In order for us to derive value from this session, I would, invite, I would invite all of us to suspend for a while anything and everything we might think we know about intellectual property. One of the challenging things uh, facilitating events like this is people come with preconceived notion that I did Google, and this is what Google told me that intellectual property is. And just for the sake of this time, I would actually wish that we suspend anything that we think we know about intellectual property, just suspend it for a while. Chances are, whatever we might think that it is intellectual property, really it might not be intellectual property. So just for a short while, I would actually implore you suspend whatever you think or whatsoever you've heard from maybe previous presentations about intellectual property. For I want to peel the layers from your eyes. I want the scales to fall from your eyes for you to, to realize that intellectual property is already around you in sufficient measures. 
And so secondly, I would actually urge all of us to be deliberate with our expectations. There is nothing that wastes time like misdirected expectation. So I would actually wish that even as we go through this session, I would actually wish that you direct intellectual property in your space as at now. You could be an entrepreneur, you could be an author, you could be in whichever space that you participate at the marketplace. I would want you to be very deliberate and direct your expectation. Thirdly, gather up all the information you can from this session. What I mean is kindly just take some good notes. Take some good notes. You will thank me later. So who is this session for? Now that we have gotten the housekeeping rules, who is this session for? One, this session is for a research practitioner. Are you a researcher in this forum? This session is for you. This session is for a speech writer. You could be a speech writer. This session is for you. You could be an academician. This session is for you. You could be anyone in, you, you, you might actually be in the process of uh, finishing or finalizing or starting your academic project, either for your certificate, your diploma, your undergraduate, or even your postgraduate. It doesn't matter. This session equally is for someone who takes part in creative writing. This session is for anyone that is constantly publishing academic material. The other day I was in another university and there's a lady who asked me, Mr. Guang, do you have a PhD? And I'm like, no, my dear, I don't. And the lady tells me, do you write? And I'm like, yes. And she tells me, do you publish? I'm like, yes, I do publish. And she tells me, continue publishing. One of these days, a university will, I will award you PhD, right? And, and that is the beauty of academia that constantly we are extending frontiers of knowledge by what we put out there. So if you're an academic, uh, uh, someone who is constantly publishing papers according to the ecosystem in which you find yourself, this session is actually for you. Are you a blogger? This session is for you as well. Are you a columnist? This session is for you as well. Are you a songwriter, a poet? This session is for you as well. Are you a novelist? This session is for you. But let me ask, and, and I, I would actually wish to, to, to get your take on this. Why do we call it a novel? Why do we call it a novel? So are you a novelist? This session is for you. Are you a person who writes scholarly materials? This session is for you. So let's get to the meat of the session. Who is an author? Why is it, is there a difference between an author and a writer? Why is it that particular people we refer to them as authors and other people we refer to them as merely writers? And that is one, the thing that will form the tone of this conversation so that moving on, you might actually distill for yourself. Okay, I've been thinking I am an author. Kumbe, I'm a writer. Or I've been thinking I'm a writer Kumbe, I'm an author. And this is the difference, right? An author is, just in case you're writing, an author is any individual that goes about their subject matter as an authority in the subject. That is who an author is. So whether you are writing kids' books or you're writing uh, academic material, or you are writing research, or you're writing songs, if you go about that subject matter as an authority, you are an author. And actually, the root word of authority is authorship. An individual cannot be an authority in any space if that individual does not in any way capture and codify his thoughts. That is the most distinguishing aspect of about who is an author, and who is a writer. That is why any person who writes for a newspaper, we don't call them authors, we call them writers. Because as a newspaper, and this is the definition of a writer, a writer is any individual who goes about their subject matter as merely sharing an opinion. So in your body of work, in the body of project that you take part in, if you are an individual that you approach that subject matter 
as merely sharing an opinion. I think this is what could be. I heard this is what could have come from there. Or I think if people did this in finance, sometimes you get a lot of books actually littering the streets of Nairobi. You take the first page and the way the person is writing about whatever he's writing about gives you a clue this person does not know whatsoever he's doing. So to that extent, that individual, in as much as I might call myself an author, that individual is a writer. And we will go, to, we, shortly we will identify what is the huge difference? What is the huge difference between me identifying myself as an author? And guess what? You not necessarily need to, 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 to get a PhD in a space for you to be an author. Just at the point whereby as an individual, you are putting out authentic knowledge. And we must distinguish between authentic knowledge and information. Majority of things that we put out there purporting to be knowledge is actually information. And it's important, particularly when we are dealing with intellectual property, it is important for all of us to distinguish this thing that I'm doing, this one is information. This thing that I'm doing, this one is now knowledge. Let me give us a typical example, and then we are going to move forward. If you have read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, the book runs into, I think, 200 plus pages. If you read that book, right, the entire book, if you were to shake that book and condense it, that book, the irreducible minimum in that book is something called the cash flow quadrant. So actually, the entire book is about the cash flow quadrant. Every page is filled with information, but the entire book sells one thing, the cash flow quadrant. And in the cash flow quadrant, Robert Kiyosaki is an authority. In that space, Robert Kiyosaki does not need anyone's validation because he framed it and he has owned it. That is what distinguishes an author from a writer. An author is aware of what they are advancing and they are aware in the ecosystems, in the marketplace, that such knowledge or such understanding can actually find a, 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 a appreciation. That is the most important thing. What is publishing? You're probably asking yourself, Mr. Guang, man, get over with your notes. I, I write, I know publishing, but what is publishing? Do we have a definition of publishing? And, and that definition of publishing, get this, in intellectual property, I practice a branch of law called intellectual property. And, and we are not going to do section 13, article 5, article 92. No, we are not going to do that. What we are going to do in this forum is for us to appreciate operationalization of intellectual property. So for that, you can actually download, if your phone has a smartphone, you can download uh, copyright and all that. But what I want us to appreciate is the operationalization of some of these words. In intellectual property, if you don't define a thing, you don't own it. So to that extent, what is publishing? Publishing is the system that an individual has put in place to avail materials for the consumption and enjoyment by the public. So Robert Kiyosaki, invented a technique in finance and he called that technique the cash flow quadrant but guess what that is what he had invented in his private space for for that thing to find relevance there is need for that thing to be translated from robert kiyosaki's private space to the public and he used the model of a book he used the model of a story so that story the system that Robert used, actually from developing that story and you finding that book in your hand, Robert is not selling you a book. Robert is actually selling you the idea in that book. And the idea in that book is what he calls the cash flow quadrant. That 
is the most important thing in the entire book. If you can actually crystallize and get that out, you don't even need to read the entire pages. Why? Because the entire book is filled with information about one thing, the cash flow quadrant. Page one, the cash flow quadrant. Page two, page 50, page 70, page 80, the cash flow quadrant. So it is in that awareness as individuals, particularly in the African continent, if we wish to identify with the frontier of where the publishing industry is, is going and where the market is going, we need to have an understanding that if I was to convert my body of work and that body of work to come from my private space into the public space, I want us to appreciate that publishing is a system. How you go about that system is really uh, limited and dependent or determined by your appreciation of, are you an author or are you a writer? So how are you, am I an author? I, I'm coming up with children's book, yes. How do I know that I am actually an author in this space? Am I an authority in what I'm trying to convey or am I merely sharing an opinion? Majority of people's books are actually sharing opinion and they are not authors. So most importantly, as an author, and I, I would wish to talk to authors, I, I'm, I'm not interested to talk to, <laughs> to, to writers. For today, we are only talking to authors. Uh, maybe the guild might be uh, considerate and prepare another event for writers. For this, we are talking to authors. So as an author, what are my duties as an author to the consumers? And what are the duties of the consumers to the author? That is the dual relationship that is set up by everything. That as an individual who is a writer, an individual who is an authority in your space, I have identified that to the extent that I'm putting something out there at that instance, excuse me, there exists a relationship with two sides. There is the side that is consuming that, and then there is a side that is giving that knowledge. So that side that is giving that information has certain duties, has certain responsibilities. The, re the, the other relationship that is actually consuming that body of work equally has other responsibility and equally has other duties. They have other benefits. To, uh, to, 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 to which end? that entire subject of moral, ethical, economic, and legal responsibilities that support the entire system we call publishing is beyond the context of this conversation. I just wanted us to appreciate that if you are a writer, you've written anything, guess what? Whatsoever you're, you've written is not complete until you as an individual put in place your own system of publishing. You might actually go and, uh, and print a book. There's a difference between printing a book and publishing. Publishing, all publishing must be printed, but not all printing is publishing. That is why we don't call exams publications. So in order for us to appreciate that, there is a case in law that there's an, a, an individual that owed someone, and, and um, I'm just merely using this as an example for us to connect with what I'm trying to say. There's an individual in law that actually owed a friend some money. And so this guy kept on pestering this guy. I want you to pay me. I need you to pay me. I need you to pay me. I need you to pay me. And this guy was fed up. And one day this guy went and took a pig and wrote on that pig that I have paid you. So the question was, did that thing that the gentleman wrote on a pig, did, was it sufficient to be regarded as a check? The court said, yes, that was a check. <laughs> So, so more importantly, it is the individual who is bearing something that is to be consumed by the public. It is the duty of that individual to set up their own system. And that is what, particularly in the African continent, that is where we have come short. We have been thinking that the only way to go about book sales is the traditional book sales in bookshops and nowadays the streets of Nairobi. That is not sufficient to have been met as a definition of what is to be regarded as publishing. So what is IP, Mr. Guang? What is IP? Intellectual property 
is the creation of the human mind with an interest of commercialization. So whatsoever you should create or you can create from your mind, if you cannot create a market out of it, guess what? Create a market. Note that there is a market existing out there. And that is whereby intellectual property has a point of departure with marketing. In marketing, we say there's a marketing out there, so you go position in the market. In the intellectual property, we are saying, no, that is not your market. If you want that to be your market, then create a market. And that is what intellectual property is all about. Intellectual property is any creation that an individual can create from their mind and to create commercialization or to create an economy around it. Let me give you a stupid example. And this example is not stupid because the giver is stupid. <laughs> no, it's just stupid because of the context. So let me say, uh, my neighbor has a very beautiful young wife, very beautiful young wife. So I conceive an idea to go and steal my neighbor's wife. And so I go and I execute my plan. I have plotted everything. I will say, hi, girl. And she will reply. And I will, I, I, and, and, and I've put the entire a script together, right? And so the lady, incidentally, has also been eyeing me. So we run away. We run away from, I run from my wife. Her, she runs from the husband. And so as we are going to uh, Tanzania, they arrest us at the border. And when they arrest us at the border, they arraign us in court. And I tell the judge, my, uh, my lord, uh, this entire thing of stealing this lady is my intellectual property. <laughs> Why? Because I created it from my mind. No, that is not intellectual property. So in order for intellectual property to qualify as intellectual property, intellectual property must not disturb public policy. For anything to qualify as intellectual property, it must not break the law. So you remember the entire story. I want to go ahead and steal my neighbor's wife. But guess what? I am a poet. So instead of executing the, the entire process, I compter everything that I want to steal her and I put it on paper. In as much as that poem has come from something that is evil, that poem becomes intellectual property. Why? Because now that poem can be consumed. That is what intellectual property is. That intellectual property is the responsibility on an individual. And that responsibility on you as an individual is to this extent. If you can create anything, you should actually create a market out of it. So let me ask you a question. Why do we call them intellectual property? Why do we call it property? Because the challenge has always been, particularly in the African continent, we tend not to appreciate anything that we cannot touch. So it is easy today if I was to ask you to do an audit of anything that you own, majority of us might not say that I own my academic project. Majority of us might not say that I own my skill. We might not say that I own my creativity. We might not say that I own things that you cannot touch. And that is why it is easy if I was to ask any one of us kindly, what do you own? You'll, say, you'll go, uh, I own my house. I own my car. I have the logbook. I own X. I own this parcel of land somewhere because I have the title deed, right? So this is why intellectual property is regarded as property. Because in as much as you cannot touch it, intellectual property at its base has economic value. Anytime you engage in intellectual property conversations and you cannot arrive at the value proposition, the economic value. Whenever we are talking about IP, we are not talking about sentimental value. Whenever we are talking about IP, we are not talking about perceived value. Whenever we are talking about IP, we are talking about economic value. If this t-shirt was to be regarded as IP, if this logo was to be regarded as IP, then this logo must actually have an economic uh, 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 equivalence in our, in, 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 our, in our cash book, in our balance sheet. 
So that the duty to extract value from this logo is actually on me if I'm to regard this logo as my intellectual property. That is why every person in Nairobi, every entrepreneur has a form of trademark but very few people can actually extract value from their trademark. Let me give you an example. The name Coca-Cola, you know that, that, that beverage that we all enjoy? The name Coca-Cola is worth 68 billion US dollars. That name Coca-Cola alone, not the formula, not their supply chain, not their business processes, not their knowledge that they have created over time, that name alone is worth 68 billion US dollars. Why? Because in that name, Coca-Cola has learned how to extract economic values. If you are to regard your book project as intellectual property, there is duty on you as a writer, and again, we are, as an author, that there is that duty to, for you to understand, this is my book. What are the value components in this book that I can extract? And from such value components grow markets. In intellectual property, we say markets are not grown out of need. Markets are grown out of value, economic value. That is very important. Every single moving piece of your book, from the title to the cover to the font, Every moving piece of your book actually has economic value components. The only problem is that majority of us, we are lacking in skill to extract value. Value in the marketplace must be extracted. Let me give you a typical example. If you have a, a thousand shillings or a 10 uh, or a 50 shillings note, there is something there called legal tender. There are 10 million interpretations to that phrase legal tender. But one of those interpretations of what legal tender means that for, the, for money in this economy to change hand, value must equally change hand and that value must be recognized at law. And that is the most important thing that are you are, are an author in this space? What are you bringing to the marketplace? Do you know, are you aware of those simple moving piece in the body of work that you have? And if you can just be aware of those simple moving pieces in your body of work. Yesterday, uh, every Friday, I conduct classes. Uh, I conduct something I call intellectual property foundation class. And yesterday I was asking a question. Why is it that majority of us we read uh, across the bridge, right? That book was an amazing book, an amazing book, an amazing storyline. But guess what? The author of that book, Major something, something, that gentleman did not make anything more out of that book. The same went with John Kiriameti. Why is it that someone like John Grisham did a, 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 a title and that title has actually been exploited into its own franchise? The James Bond franchise is actually a work, a literary work. It's because they are aware of identifying that in your book, the first place of ownership is the storyline. That story is yours. Now, where a majority of us miss it is that we go about writing in whichever space. Some of us, particularly in Kenya today, everyone is a coach in Kenya. <laughs> everyone is a coach. There is a financial coach. There is a sleep coach. There is a gossip coach. Everyone is coach in Kenya. The only coaches I'm trying to, to, to see if they will come up is uh, a Mira Chewing coach. Everyone in Kenya is a coach, but guess what? Why is it that the coaches we have in Kenya, they are not aware of how to extend, how to extend the market frontiers in the spaces they operate? So today I am talking about emotional intelligence. Tomorrow I'm talking about depression. The other day I'm talking about dating, why? because I am merely an, uh, uh, someone sharing opinion. Authorities carry on just one space. So a huge part of the market and a huge part of unlocking our markets and our economies is in us understanding that as an authority in your space, you need to be aware of what are the moving piece in your storyline. So let me give us a typical example. 
Let's say you are writing, uh, creative writing, you're writing a story. And so as you're writing a story, you ask yourself, where will I, uh, where will I set my story? And you go like, uh, let me set it in Nairobi. Wrong. Why is it wrong to set your story in Nairobi? Because you will not own Nairobi. Nairobi is on, already owned by the county of Nairobi. So if I was to structure a conversation, if I was to structure a story, then I realized that the beginning point of intellectual property, the thing that I can claim as mine, begins with the setting. So I will create a universe. The moment you create that universe, you own that entire universe. It becomes your intellectual property and you can do anything you want with it. Another thing, if I'm crafting, another point of crafting, uh, another point of crafting a story is characters. Where majority of us miss it is we don't know that your most important value in your story is your character. And so how we go about structuring character, the guy is called Otieno. And Otieno is 32 to 56 years old, right? So you, you, you are very passive at how you are structuring the content or the persona of Otieno. Do you know Bond, the name Bond never existed until James Bond was framed. The name Bond never existed. Do you know the name King George never existed until Shakespeare came along? Do you know that, and that it's because they understood. The way you create a universe, you create a universe by asking yourself, what will I own in this universe? When most of us, we were enjoying uh, Game of Thrones, right? And, and, and I'm, I was an addict of Game of Thrones. Guess what? In Game of Thrones, everything is owned. Everything in Game of Thrones is owned. <laughs> Why? Because they have realized that your intellectual property begins with you owning. You can have a story, an amazing story. And that is the problem that we had with uh, Across the Bridge. The, the story was amazing, but when it came to characters, the characters were very generic, very generic. Mealy. What do you own about Mealy? The name Mealy already exists. So to that extent, you might frame a very amazing character, but you cannot exploit the intellectual property trapped in that character. So I hope I have labored enough on what it means to have property in intellectual property. There are three definitions of intellectual property. The first definition is the academic definition. And majority of people in this forum, uh, in, uh, on this thread, majority of us, we have come through the system of academia, either as a certificate, diploma, or undergraduate, or by the grace of God where you've arrived. The academic definition of intellectual property means this, that intellectual property is the creation of the human mind with the rights of acknowledgement and credits that come from such work. If you are keen, whenever you are submitting your work, the first page of your submitting your work was a page called acknowledgement, <laughs> right? Majority of us, we just write acknowledge it. And we think, I want to thank my wife for standing by me all those sleepless nights and, 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 of course, Naomi, of course. Uh, I want to thank my wife uh, for, for uh, uh, bearing with me I, I, all those sleepless nights, late nights that I was coming, working on the manuscript. I want to thank our three boys, Jim, Otieno, and Saki Angoa. And because of you, I, I could not have write or written this book. And I want to thank our cat and our dog. <laughs> right? <laughs> In academia, <laughs> In academia, you owe anyone that participated. It is something you owe, you owe them. You don't do it out of the goodness of your own heart. You don't do it all because you're considerate. No, that is a responsibility that you owe them. Because as far as intellectual property is concerned, in academia, the only way people get a reward in intellectual property is they must be acknowledged, they must be given credit. So that is intellectual property. The other definition of intellectual property 
is the legal definition. I'm a legal practitioner, so we must actually introduce it legally. So the legal definition of intellectual property, and this is where I pity anyone that Googled. <laughs> I pity anyone that Googled, because if you Google, they'll tell you that intellectual property is the creation of the human mind. There are four types of intellectual property. No, there are no four types of intellectual property. So this is what we are getting at. The legal definition of intellectual property is this. Intellectual property is the creation of the human mind with the specific rights, duties, privileges that are legally given to such works. So that is the definition of intellectual property legally. So if I was uh, talking to you as a lawyer, I would actually be talking about section 52 and section three and section four and article 10 and article 11. Why? Because as a lawyer, my interest is only to the extent that there are legal rights, legal privileges and legal duties that come from such work. I don't care what you do with that. And that is why in Nairobi today, you will have people who have trademarks, people who have patents that they have actually registered, but they cannot exploit their patents. Why? They merely settled at intellectual property at the legal definition. So the next intellectual property that we have is what I would call the entrepreneurial definition of intellectual property. And this is the definition that I would want all of us to adopt moving forward. In entrepreneurship, as an author, you are an entrepreneur. As a storyteller, you are an entrepreneur. As a designer, you are an entrepreneur. So as an entrepreneur, regardless of how you come to the marketplace, this is what I would want you to adopt as the definition of intellectual property. Intellectual property is the creation of the human mind with an interest of commercialization. Let me ask you a question. Where is your mind? Majority of us, if I ask you, point for me where your mind is, majority of us will say, my mind is here. No, this is your brain. This is your brain. This is not your mind. Your mind is at a faculty is one of the faculties in your human soul. If you can identify where your soul is, voila, you have identified where your mind is. This is not your mind. Your mind communicates with this brain through things called impulses. So your body will give special impulses. Let me give you a typical example. If I am a musician, the same source where I get my creativity is the same, same source where an engineer gets theirs. It's the same, same source where an architect gets theirs. But when it arrives at here, when the body gives it the impulse, that impulse is actually decoded with your brain, dependent with how you have equipped your brain. So if I'm an individual that have only equipped my brain one way, anytime my mind emits those impulses, my brain will only codify them one way. So if I am a graphic designer, the same, same way I am getting ideas is the same, same way an engineer gets their, their ideas. It's in order for us to ensure that we have equipped this big box we call a head dangling from above here. That's not an insult. My teacher used to tell us that in high school. Omera, don't dangle that big box in your head. You call it a head. So this thing, Inside this thing is a brain. That brain is not your mind. That brain is not your mind. And that is why I can give all of us sets of words, the same sets of words. The way all of us, we are going to come and craft our sentences will be dependent with how many words we have, right? If majority of us, and actually this is something that is very disappointing. There is this statistics that was done a while back that majority of people you come across, they have 50 words of vocabulary, 50 words. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they go so like, mm, you know what I mean? <laughs> that is someone who is disabled as far as expression is concerned. Because if you cannot equip this thing up here with vocabulary, if you cannot equip this thing, if you are someone who is an engineer, you need to equip this thing with engineering vocabularies. If you are an individual who is a coder, you need to equip this thing with coding vocabulary. If you're a musician, you need to equip this thing with musical vocabulary. Why? Because to the extent of your vocabulary, you are either empowered or limited. 
characteristics of IP. So we have said IP, 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 and publishing and author. So these are the characteristics of IP. All form of IP is labor. All form of IP is labor. Uh, today in Kenya, if you work physically, you might be paid less. But if you work intellectually, you'll be paid more. That is why if you go to a gyna, I kind of will just sit with you for 30 minutes and you're paying that gyna 4,500, <laughs> right? And, and, and somewhere in, in, in Kanyamkago, working the whole day under the blaring sun will only make 150 shillings. Of course, this doctor is working from a point of expertise, right? But that only goes to show us that our dynamics at the marketplace has shifted. Those people who work physically are not rewarded highly. The people who work on their best judgment get rewarded highly. So intellectual property operates for an individual to know that it is a form of labor. Your singing is a form of labor. Your writing is a form of labor. It is not only passion, it is a form of labor, which is very important. Intellectual property equally is a form of raw material. That means that your book is not the end result. You've come up with a book, congratulations. That book is not the end result. So you are a designer. You have sketched some sketches for a fabric. Congratulations. That fabric is not the end result. That fabric is merely a beginning, right? So you have come up, you have grown something. Congratulations. That design is merely the starting point. So in order for us to appreciate it and approach it from that angle, if you can approach your manuscript as a raw material, then you begin to ask yourself, what are those resource areas in this raw material? What can I do with, 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 what can I do with my framework? On this basis, on this storyline, what can I do with my framework? If I was to do something from my premise as an author, what is my premise? What can I do with my premise? Well, to what extent do I own that premise? That, my friends, is what is distinguishing the African author from the ones that we, have, we are enjoying and we are reading their books from abroad. Why? They can pick their books apart. They can pick, they can pick their premise and they can do something with their premise. If you are to reduce the book, Think and grow rich. You know that book? Everyone in this forum, I think we have read that book, Think and Grow Rich. I remember I was given that book when I was very broke as a young man, and I dreamt with that book. <laughs> I dreamt with that book. If you can reduce that book to one line, this is the premise. The entire premise of that book is this. Whatsoever the mind can believe, can think and believe the person can achieve. So that is what actually Napoleon Hill wrote for the entire almost 300 pages. Just that one thing, whatever you can believe and conceive the mind the person can achieve. That is the entire premise. If you look at the book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the entire premise of that book is just a single phrase, the cash flow quadrant. So that is the entire phrase or, or the premise of that book. Have you identified your premise and how authentic is your your premise is your premise merely you sharing an opinion or is your premise positioning you to be an authority in that space if you are an authority in your space the market ecosystem will seek you out it's important for us to know that ip is a form of resource ip is a form of money Money. IP is money. I have mentioned that the name Coca-Cola is worth 68 billion US dollars. Yes, that is money. So if you are a writer, if you are an author, sorry, if you are an author in this thread, and I was to ask you, do you have any clue what your book is worth? Majority of us have no clue. We have no clue. So sometimes we think that the worth of your book is the cost of putting the book together. And that 
is the disparity we have at the marketplace. Majority of us, if you're a musician, we think the cost of my song is the 15,000 that I will be charged to go and produce that song. That is the cost, that is not the worth, the value. So intellectual property, if you are a, a, a writer, if you're a speech writer, that speech that you're putting together, you must have the awareness that this is the economic value of this script, this speech, excuse me. You remember I began by the story about Rio de Janeiro? That gentleman wrote an entire, an entire speech, but from the entire speech, the only thing that that guy coined was global warming. And today, if you want funding, if you don't put something called global warming or climate change somewhere in your proposal, you are not getting funded. <laughs> so that gentleman literally, from just that speech, the gentleman literally created an entire market, an entire industry. Why? Intellectual property is a form of money. And some of these characteristics, it's beyond the tenor of this uh, conversation for us to explore. IP is an equalizer. Let me, let, let, let me label on that for two minutes. You remember when most of us, when we went to school, you remember they told us this, that there was something called a factor of production. And actually this one was in the days of Adam Smith as Adam Smith was putting together the wealth of nations. In those days, they were thinking of a nation with a huge and huge chunks of land will have a lot of say in production. And that is where they came up with the, uh, the factors of production. One of the factors of production they gave us was something called land. Land was a factor of production. So that means any person that had chunks and chunks of land actually controlled the extent to which production will be felt at the marketplace. Is land still a factor of production today? No, my friends, land is not a fact of production today. Let me give you two examples. The most unsuccessful company in Eastern Central Africa has more than 4,000 acres of land. I don't want to mention it. <laughs> the most successful company in Eastern Central Africa has less than two acres of land, Safaricom. So today, the bulk of Safaricom's business model is not land. The bulk of Safaricom's business model is actually M-Pesa. And what is M-Pesa? Intellectual property. So in our times, if an individual wishes to appear at the marketplace, the only thing you need to ask yourself, what aspect of intellectual property am I bringing to the marketplace? There are people who have gone and they have studied for all their lives until they get PhD. And then when they come to the marketplace, they're only paid 300,000 shillings. There is a musician I know who cannot even put English together, but makes 5 million shillings every month from Skiza. <laughs> so in our times, Land is not a factor of production. And that is why it's very important. And I want to appreciate um, the Writers Guild for putting this together. It is very important for us to know that in this time, what can equalize your, part your part participation and performance at the marketplace is, are you aware of your intellectual property? As an individual, are you aware? As an individual, as a company, are you aware? what you can do with your intellectual property. So in our times, intellectual property is a great equalizer. When we're having a conversation about gender emancipation, oh, men should do this and men, it, it, the way we are structuring the entire conversation of gender parity in itself is a mistake. For instance, if, 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 if in Nairobi today we say that certain, certain words in Nairobi are exclusively for women. Will men feel proud that, hey, constituencies <laughs> But guess what? When it comes to intellectual property, no one gives you permission. The only thing that limits you and what you can do and what you can become is you yourself and me myself. 
the extent to awareness of what I know. In our time, if you're writing, write this. In our time, these are the factors of production. In our time, if you want to be sought out, you must align yourself with one of these. One, are you skilled in a unique area? People will seek you out. Are you, uh, do you have a unique expression of talent? People will seek you out. Do you have a unique idea? People will seek you out. And most importantly, do you have an expression of knowledge? And us guys in this forum, guess what we are bringing to the marketplace as authors? We are bringing knowledge. So if all of us, we can just be aware that the knowledge we are carrying, you should convert it into a fact of production and intellectual property awareness should actually help you in understanding that this is actually equalizing my participation at the marketplace. The most important, the most important characteristics of intellectual property is this. Intellectual property never depreciates in value. I want to give us uh, three examples in passing. If I give you a plot of land worth 10 million, I've given you a plot of land worth 10 million. Oh, this is the multiple question. So you choose one. <laughs> so I've given you a plot of land worth 10 million, or I give you a car worth 10 million, or I give you a check worth 10 million, or I ask you, can I give you a book, the manuscript to a book that is worth 10 million? What will you choose? Any person who has chosen land, you remember we had said land is 10 million. Land does not appreciate in value. Land only appreciates in value to the extent that that land is favored in pre how it is predisposed, where it is. But guess what? The moment you've put something on that land, that land from that point henceforth depreciates in value, right? Ah, Magnus. Magnus has said a uh, book. Okay. So let me say, so that is land. Land depreciates in value, right? The moment you've put something on that land, it starts depreciating in value. <laughs> okay. So you want to put, uh, the next one was a car, <laughs> 10 million. My bro, <laughs> the moment we talk about a car, showroom. Talitwala. Bro, the moment we talk about a car, showroom, your car is going to be wear and tear. So 10 million, you drive it for a month, it's going to depreciate. If I give you a check of 10 million, guess what? No sooner, you guys remember that English, no sooner did this happen than this happens. No sooner do you get that check into your account, that amount into your account, guess what? Inflation hits it hard. So of all these things that people are running after, the most important thing that you and I should actually ask ourselves every day, have I accumulated IP? Have I accumulated IP today? Guess what? Because IP is the only form of resource on earth that never depreciates in value. The only other source of resource that never depreciates in value is the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. But everything else depreciates in value. Intellectual property is the only thing that never depreciates in value. And that is something that all of us need to take really uh, keen awareness of that, hey, am I aware of IP in my space? Am I aware of IP in my space? Do I even know what IP is? Do I even know? Do you even have a clue? This is what, uh, if, 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 you, if you have interacted with me for a while, you might have picked up this phrase. I say this, a day without an idea is a wasted day. 
So today, just get what? If you end up at 3 or 9 p.m. in the evening and you have not accumulated any idea, guess what? You have wasted today. <laughs> just that simple, right? So the most important thing that you and I should engage in on a daily basis is one, have I accumulated an idea today? Have I perfected? Have I sharpened my skill? Have I sharpened my extent of expression? Have I sharpened this aspect of my profit, my productivity? Have I sharpened that? Because in our times, while they told us that land was a factor of production, in our time, land is not a factor of production. No, it's not. Of course, people must be fed. And of course, people must live right? But land does not determine what you will make. In our time, that book will actually determine what you're going to make. That manuscript that you're putting together will determine what you're going to make. If you can just know, and the most of us in this forum, we have done academic projects. If you can just know the amount of value that is lying dormant in your academic project, Majority of us, you'll even resign at your job. <laughs> People say that mutual can be, be, be fake. I'm sorry. You, you will even resign at your job. Why? Most of us will leave value for peanuts. Most of us will leave real wealth for peanuts. <laughs> the most valuable thing for us to do from today henceforth, just take it from me. I want you to go and look at and ask yourself, in this project for my degree, what was I advancing? Let me give you a typical example in passing. When in, 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 in 20, in 20, in 20, 2015, 2014, there about, there's a lady who was working for an insurance company and she had done her PhD thesis. And nowadays there is a requirement for people to publish. And so she published online and there's an institution somewhere in Germany, a city called Dusseldorf that came across what she was advancing. And so they said, uh, Dr. would want you to allow us to try and see, research this thing further. And, and she was like, no, let me go ask. And so she asked uh, among her PhD friends and most of her PhD friends were telling her, no, do not do that. It will spoil the overall character and integrity of the body of your work. You know, some of those big words with small meanings. And so somehow she got my card. And in consultation, I asked her, Dr. what have you done? And so she was like, there is this requirement that we need to publish. I'm like, okay, that little bit I can figure out. But Dr. what have you done? to academia. Daktari, do you know that by what you are advancing in academia, a university somewhere in the world will begin to offer degree in the line of your thesis? Never mind she receives 97,000 euros until for the, next, uh, for the next 17 years, she'll be receiving 97,000 euros every year for having licensed her PhD thesis. After 17 years, it reverts back to her. That is what knowledge can do for all of us. Why? Knowledge, write this. This is the most important thing you, you will pick from this lecture today. Knowledge is proprietary. Knowledge is proprietary. Proprietary is not a big word. You know, most people say, think like, hey, the, 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 there's a lawyer who is coming to talk to us. And so most of us, we feel like, ah, that guy is coming with big words. No, 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 no. <laughs> knowledge is not proprietary. Knowledge, knowledge is proprietary, but proprietary is not a big word. Proprietary is actually a, a very small word with a small meaning. It means aspect of ownership. So what are the specific steps? And guess what? Akini, yes, you have. <laughs> yes, you have. Three steps to create a market from your book. Three steps to create a market from your book. Whether it's a book, whether it's a blog, whether it's a short story, whether it's a speech, whether regardless, this is how you can create a market. Realize whatsoever you're doing and you did not create that market, that is not your market. And that is why today, <laughs> Safari Cop can charge whatever they are charging and people will pay. <laughs> why? Safaricom literally created their own market. 
literally created their own market. Safaricom. So let me let me tell you what. Whenever you create a market, your client and customers will arrive at the value of put. But if you don't create a market, and that's the problem that we have with everyone getting things from Turkey. Nairobi today is, is like semi-Turkey. Why? Some, some, someone took the step, went to Turkey, got stuff. Some other idiots, idiot is not an insult. Some other idiots were just waiting with money. Oh, it works. They also rushed to Turkey. So guess what? The first person that got it right, the market belongs to them. And that is what happens in every market. In every market, there's someone who came up with the motivational. Every person today with a mouth is a motivational speaker. Every person with a mouth. If you can put two sentences together, and, and, and by the grace of God, you have three, seven scriptures, you're a motivational speaker. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because someone started that market. And because majority of us, we are lazy, we don't want to go out there and craft our own market. Everyone is a motivational speaker today. <laughs> Everyone. Everyone is a motivational speaker. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't look down on motivational speaker. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, Lucy, I, I, it was just an illustration I was trying to form. <laughs> so guess what? If you want to create your market, regardless of what you do, this is how to create any market. And realize what? We were thinking of, we were talking of wealth. How to use your intellectual property to unlock wealth, right? That is what we are talking about. One of those ancient manuscripts that I so love says that you shall remember it's the Lord your God that gives you power to make wealth. Wealth is never given. Wealth is made. Wealth is made. So as an individual, it's me to realize what are those things that I have that can actually create a market for me. If you would call, I practice law. I practice a branch of law called intellectual property. If I was to compete with people in intellectual property, do you know how many people I'll be competing with globally? Over a hundred million. Every idiot who does not know what to do is an intellectual property lawyer, <laughs> everyone. But guess what? Out of that, we created our own market and our market is called intangible resource awareness. In that, no one competes with us. Globally, no one competes with us. That is the same, same thing that you can do. Regardless of whichever market space you are, you can convert your intellectual property, craft a market that no one else will infiltrate. That is what Coca-Cola is. The other day I'd reached out to, uh, to, 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 to Pepsi. We were thinking of doing some partnerships. So I reached out to Pepsi like, hey, you guys have been here for like seven years. <laughs> and Pepsi said, we don't want to awaken Coca-Cola. <laughs> we don't want to awaken Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know, because Coca-Cola is not joking. And that's how all of us, we need to be. People need to fear your presence. If you are a writer, if you are an author, people need to fear your work. Why? Because your work comes and shifts the entire marketplace. That is only if you know these three things. So can we get to the three things? Okay, one. It is the duty of every author to, one, identify proprietary aspects, features, components, elements in their work that is your duty. <laughs> that is not a duty of your lawyer. <laughs> that is not a duty of your editor. <laughs> that is your duty. <laughs> Let me give you a, an example. Eh? So someone came up with a story and called it James Bond. A story and called it James Bond. And so they asked, how can we create an economy around James Bond? And they said, okay, let us make James Bond so enviable. Everything about James Bond will be so cool, right? About this time is where, when there was Cold War all over Europe, there was Cold War. Guess what? James Bond fit into that market ecosystem. Why? Because they wanted to create someone that can be emulated across the board. After that, after that, and James Bond is always smooth with the ladies. 
very smooth with the ladies. That is deliberate. You will never find an ugly James Bond. <laughs> you will never find an ugly James Bond. <laughs> You will never, you will never find a James Bond that is a stammerer that talks like this. No, you'll never find. Why? James Bond is the model of what a spy is supposed to be. Now, let me show you how they created a market. There is a university in the US that is called Harvard, Harvard University, right? So James Bond franchised a part, the James Bond franchise, they franchised a part of that script for executive business leaders. Any person who has studied in Harvard Business School always introduces themselves like this. My name is Bond, James Bond. You will never find any James uh, work of James Bond that James Bond does not introduce himself like that. Never, <laughs> you will never find. Why? Because they have identified that the way James Bond introduces himself is proprietary. It's proprietary. So it is you as an author to sit down with your manuscript. This is not someone, something that someone will do for you. This is something that you do for yourself. You do for yourself. So as an author, you sit with one. What is the setting of this plot? right? What is the setting of this entire work? And you ask yourself, do I own this setting? No, I don't own this setting. So what do I need to own in this setting? And then you ask yourself, how can I create a universe that I will own? If you don't own a universe, you don't own anything you're doing. And what is that thing that Jehovah did? He created the universe for himself. He said, let there be light. And so he called the entire thing into existence. Why? Because without a universe, you don't exist. And equally, that part most authors have never identified. So you're writing a book. A book has no setting. The setting is weak. You cannot own anything on the setting. If you cannot own a setting, I don't care how amazing the plot is. That thing is weak. Have you ever seen Gari Gari Nakimbia na Miguya Punda? Akuna Gari Nakimbia na Miguya Punda. Why? Gari Ukimbia na Miguya Gari. So that means if you want to build something that you can sustain, start with your setting. Start with your setting. And your setting is your universe as an author. I'm not stuck you semati. No, <laughs> I'm just passionate about this. So you as an author, you need to identify your duty to create a universe. You begin that with everything in your story. Everything about your cover should actually help you. Every, you should actually take advantage of everything in your cover. Have you seen a yellow car? Thank you, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. Have you, have you ever seen a yellow car? Let me shock you. It's, it's just nowadays that they are, they are bringing out yellow cars. In the 70s, uh, insurance companies in the US did some research. And in the research they did, they identified that if there was an accident on the road, nine out of 10 times, it's actually an accident involving a yellow car. <laughs> yes. And you know why? Because the human brain reacts negatively to color yellow. The human brain. You might not know it, and that is why very few companies have yellow in part of their corporate colors. Very few companies. Actually, companies that have yellow are very aggressive companies. But that is what they came out with. And today, up to date, very many companies shy away from yellow. Why? Out of that research. So you as an individual, you should actually ask yourself, why did I choose this color for my book? Why did I choose? You will never find a Robert Kiyosaki book with pink color. <laughs> you will never find <laughs> a Robert Kiyosaki book. Pengine zile zina printiwa tao, Nairobi. But real Robert Kiyosaki book, the pages, the first page is actually color purple. Have you identified that? Rich Dad, Poor Dad is actually color purple. Some shade of purple and black and orange something, something. So you should identify proprietary. The phrase proprietary simply means aspect of ownership. And two, you should 
as an individual, as an author, you should learn to appreciate the identified forms of property in your work. This is what appreciate means. Eh? You know depreciation, you know depreciation and appreciation, you know that bit. Eh? So depreciation happens when something loses its value. That is depreciation. Appreciation happens when something gains value. So intellectual property, this, this would be a typical example. This thing first existed as a sketch on the book of someone. It was just a sketch, this thing, the way it looks. It was just a sketch to begin with. The gentleman or the lady, I think it was a gentleman. Okay, let's call her a lady. So the lady who drew this actually migrated it from a paper to this. The point it left the paper, the point it took on a physical form gave it value over what it had on the paper. That is what it means to appreciate the value of intellectual property. So if you have identified that, hey, my corporate color is pink, like there's, a, there's, an, there's an insurance company with color pink, that is weird. <laughs> there's an insurance company with color pink. So if I identify that this is color pink, then the point of appreciating the value, the value, and that is why the color red of, 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 of Coca-Cola, that color red is worth 18 billion US dollars. Just that color red. You cannot do anything with that color red. You cannot. They will, they will do for you things no one has ever done to you. <laughs> yeah, why that is not only a color, that is their property. Why they have graduated the value in that uh, shade of color red. I hope that one makes sense. So I would want you, my friend, I would want you, my friend, moving forward to have very deliberate things that you're doing. Very deliberate. I'm this kind of a person, I just don't throw words. Any word I throw are carefully crafted to leave an impression. I just don't do those. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? <laughs> no. I am very deliberate. So you also, my friend, this is what I would want you to do with your writing. Whether you're a blogger, can you begin to build something from a point of awareness? This is how I want to go about my blogging. This is how I want to go about my storytelling. This is my craft in my storytelling. This is the beat that I identify as that now is my weakness in my storytelling. This is what I identify. Oh, this is the weakness in how I structure dialogue. If you want to be shocked, particularly of those people who are writing for us, particular, th thank you, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. Partic particularly for those people who are writing short stories, we are very weak at weaving dialogue. Nothing is amazing as dialogue. Whenever I watch movies, I don't watch movies for fun. I'm not a fan. I watch movies to study how they structure dialogue. Dialogue will make or will break your work. And guess what? So as an individual, if I have identified that dialogue is part of my proprietary value, then there are things I can do deliberately with my dialogue that will cause value to come out of that dialogue. And that is why, like we had said about James Bond, you will never find James Bond when you're in stammer. You will never find a James Bond stammer. They're very deliberate about that. And so, where does value begin? Where does value begin? Uh, value is defined. Value is defined. In the things that you've identified as an entrepreneur, value is defined. If you have identified that this, uh, in my other life, I produce music. In my other life, I produce music. And when people come to me like Nyaji Blacks, oh, in the studio they call me Blacks, B L U X. So when people come to me, Nyaji Nyaji Blacks, mazi mazi ni kwata beat man, ni kwata beat. And so when people come, I always ask, so what is your strong point? Are you a vocalist? So if you are a vocalist, I would want to find someone to write for you lyrics, to write for you a song. The, the, the problem, particularly with the gospel industry in Kenya, is people singing mediocrity. 
and attaching the name of Jesus. And a lot of why, why, yo, yo, ulibeba msalaba, ulibeba msalaba. And then someone else will say, msalaba, ulibeba. And then someone will come up with say, ulibeba msalaba. It's just the same, same thing they're singing. So that is mediocrity. So we are not placing specific burden on ourselves to put a demand on ourselves, right? So as an individual, and that's why we are talking about value. As an author, your value begins from your point of you identifying what is that unique thing that I'm contributing. So as an author, am I good at framing sentences, dialogues? Is that my strong suit? Then you ask yourself, then I will need to be deliberate in that. And that one can equally grow for me a market. Am I good in crafting characters? Do I bring out characters that are believable? I used to enjoy Game of Thrones. And I used to enjoy one particular character that was called Little Finger. <laughs> Anytime you, you would, he, he would come on Little Finger, the guy always had some ridiculous sentences. <laughs> Sometimes I would imagine, who writes for these guys? Little Finger particularly. The, 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 there is a line he came up with like, the days are evil when things that are looking at you are not the things that you're seeing because the things that are seeing sometimes don't even have eyes. And you're like, where did they come up with that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, little figure, that guy was amazing. So as an entrepreneur, as someone who is an author, you carry your weight because that where you are portion weight is where now you will find potentials, you will find viable aspects of generating revenue. Why? Because if you can have really amazing characters, what stops you from franchising your characters? That is what Disney does. Disney will develop an amazing character and then they will license that character. They will rent that character. They will do things with that character. Why? Because that character has become part of their Disney property. It begins with identifying value. In intellectual property, my friends, value is defined. Value is defined. Never forget that. I might not have, because of time, I might not have sufficient time to go into what I had prepared for all of us, but value is defined. So let me just give us uh, two, two, two pages and then we take a full stop briefly to attend to a few questions. So this is a value path. This is a value path. I think the third step, 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 where value begins is value is defined. Value is defined kindly. I, I think I will share with Patricia. I, I think I will share with Patricia uh, this material and Patricia will share them with you uh, if you provide Patricia with your uh, uh, Magnus, just briefly, but not to Jamaliza, bro. <laughs> just briefly. Uh, so we are talking about value path and, and what is value? If you're writing, write this. This is what value is. Again, you will never find these definitions on Google. These are not owned by Google. These are definitions that are owned by the Institute of Intangible Resource Awareness. These are our own definitions. I would actually advise you moving forward. If you want to show that you understand something, come up with your own definitions. Come up with your own definitions. It helps. Understanding is measured to the point of consistency in definition. It helps. What is a value path? A value path is the process something goes through and that thing retains certain values. That is what it's called a value path. You remember when they, they, when they told us something with uh, 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 this thing, this thing that uh, this thing that changes and changes and it comes a pupa and it comes a lava and it comes a butterfly. Thank you. And, and it goes through metamorphosis. So the metamorphosis is what in this place I would call the value path of your author, your, your thing as a, an author, your value path. And so this is what a value, uh, your value path is. Your value path, if you're just, if you're writing, you, you'll find the notes later. If you're writing, 
the value part begins with thought. Thought. Let me tell you. Thought is the most amazing thing we should actually teach everyone to, to be aware of. Thoughts can be triggered. Thoughts can be triggered. There's a movie they did uh, that was actually uh, 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 scratching this topic. There's a movie they did by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. He did a movie called Inception. I would, I would invite you to study that movie. It, it's about thought. And one of those things that majority of us don't really appreciate is thought. So the value point uh, you, you start, I want, to st I, I, I want to write something. I want to write something. Guess what? You're limited to the point whereby you don't own words. You and I, majority of us, we have not been empowered. We have not been equipped with the skill to come up with our own phrases. Very few people have. Majority of us, 90% of us, we don't have that. I don't have it. And, and so majority of us have that phrase. You coin a phrase and people use it. But majority of us, it's a thought. And when you have that thought, you don't leave that thought at that instance of thought. You graduate a thought into an idea. That is a value part. So guess this, all ideas must be thoughts. Get that? All ideas must be thoughts, but not all thoughts are ideas. Sour. So once you have, they say that the human brain is made up of a hundred billion cells. Constantly, they're going zzz, 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 constantly, right? That is what they say. <laughs> that is what they say. I don't know who sat down and said, uh, cell 15, cell 23, cell 58, cell 62, six. Let me go for the wash, uh, for the bathroom. And then they came back, cell 52, cell 188. I don't know who counted, but that is what they tell us that the human brain is made up of 100 billion cells. And they're saying at every given moment, an individual has 100 million thoughts. <laughs> that, that's, that's funny. At any given moment, you have 100 million thoughts. So this is what thinking is. Thinking is picking one thought and staying on that one thought. That is what thinking is. So as you stay on that thought, it will unlock another rel relative thought and it will unlock another thought. So that is what it's called the thinking pattern or the thinking process. Majority of us, you're like, think. No, that is not thinking. That is worrying. <laughs> thinking is different from worrying. So when an individual is thinking, an individual has stayed on one thought and you have isolated every other thought. So that you look at this thought what equivalent thoughts will it attract? So when it attracts those thoughts, that is how you frame an idea. I hope that is clear. So that is part of the value path. So you begin with a thought, that thought opens up into an idea, and then that idea is opened up to IP. The person who developed this, just for the sake of, the person who developed this came up with something like, I would want some people to carry water and they would be mobile with that water. And so they were like, okay, okay. So what would I do? Okay, let me think of something. And, and, and he came up with this. <laughs> so this one, even the shape, the texture is actually geared towards mobility. So once you have this thing, okay, I can be somewhere stationary, but this one is actually for mobility, for mobility. So guess what? This thing is not limited by the color it's painted. Actually the color is painted is immaterial. What is very material is the texture because the texture actually ha happens to heighten its usage. That is why even when you're drinking water, they, they, they develop something for us here where to clip your lip. I think you can see this. So that is how you frame a thought and you develop it. And so when he came, she or he came up to this point, now this one is called intellectual property. This thing created a market. After that market, then revenue generation springs. That is what we would call as a value path. Up to that point, I want to apologize for talking for nonstop for one hour, 40 minutes. Yeah, I'm like my bro. I have my, my, my eldest brother used to speak for seven days. Yeah, so 
questions, please. Okay, so if you have a question, you can either unmute and ask the question, or you can still type it in the comment section so that Mwalimu can see it. I've decided to call you Mwalimu. I'm going to leave any other thing I've been calling you. I'll call you Mwalimu from now on. Okay, Naomi, I can see you. you want to say something. Mute. Now, uh, I, I, can't ask, hear you. I want to ask a question. Can I go? Okay. okay. Thank you, Molim, for such a powerful, powerful session. Thank you for the enthusiasm of bringing us up to speed on IP. I really appreciate it. Now, my question is just straight to the point. After writing a manuscript, uh, whatever manuscript, whether it's a story, plotline, science fiction, whatever it is. And, you know, it's got original phrases, original characters, original plotline setting. How do you now move towards owning that IP? What is the process before you release it to the world? That's my question. Okay, there's somebody. Now, Naomi, do you want to ask a question? Yes, please. I have a question. Okay, continue. And my question and is, Lucy, if you can just unmute, if you if you can just mute Lucy, there's some noise. Okay, Naomi, you'll ask the question, then Lucy will ask next. So okay, let's go, Naomi. All right. First, thank you so much, uh, Mwalimu, for the wonderful session. I have learned so much. Um, God bless you. My question is just following up since you started. You mentioned when you're talking when you, your book, you need to craft your characters need to be very strong. That has come out clear for me. What happens in the case where your book doesn't have characters? Because I was in the process of writing a book that doesn't have characters because it is a language book. Um, could you kindly uh, elaborate what would now be the moving factor there? What, would, what should I focus on? All right, that would be it. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Hello, Lucy, you can go, you can ask the question, Lucy. Uh, thank you so much, Patricia and the colleagues. And thank you so much, Mwalimu. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm with gratitude friend here. Sasa, the, my, thank you so much. I think this was a very enlightening um, conversation because I, I guess a lot of us have, have always thought about intellectual property as you are as a BN to Naperekanga Uko and that's it. But, uh, and, and um, I, was, I was curious about the distinction that you made between a writer and an author. And I, I ask this because I am I am just about to get the bragging rights of becoming an author in a few weeks. Patricia knows where we are with my book. Um, and, and this is a book that elucidates my own story. And out of that story, it's actually the book is titled The Unbeatable Spirit. And out of that book, I am creating, uh, I have actually done a bit of rebrand. I'm in the process of doing rebranding. And uh, my brand is now going to be called The Unbeatable Spirit with Lucy. Um, because then I want, there are many things that I want to do out of, out of that book. Now, something you said, curiously, is uh, about the colors and, and the thoughts. And I was thinking about, I already have crafted my own brand colors and I know what they mean and what they represent. But now when we're developing the, the, the book, the cover of the book, it, it is it wasn't I, I didn't quite think about that that flow of whether it should actually then have the brand colors that, that I represent and I am curious to ask does this matter or do I just continue to you know continue to create my brand or do I have to redo the book cover I am with you Mimi Ikitu Munaita speaker author and coach that is where I am and that is where I'm going to be and in fact leading in Africa thank you Thank you, Lucy. That's the unbeatable spirit. 
Yes. So, uh, any other person with a question? I, I hope you've written down Mwalimu so that you can answer her. Okay, if there's no question, I'm going to let Mwalimu. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I usually don't like to be called a, a lawyer or an advocate. Uh, people tend to, 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 to look at us <laughs> differently. So I just want to be called Mwalimu. Mwalimu sounds humble. <laughs> Though I was told it's very hard to find a humble Luo. <laughs> I'm trying to be humble. <laughs> That was a joke, that was a joke. Uh, Magnus asked something amazing, that what is the process of owning a manuscript? A manuscript is the entire work. And a manuscript has very many moving pieces. The most important thing with what uh, Magnus has asked is ownership. There's a huge difference between ownership and possession. Majority of us, I'm not playing semantics. Majority of us, we possess things that we have, but we don't own them. Let me give us an example, and then I'll come back to what uh, Magnus asked. The house in which you're living, uh, if you're living in a rented house, who owns that house? Is it you? who pays uh, whether lease or rent? Is it the agent or the company that's managing it? Is it the owner, the proprietor, or is it the government who owns that house? Because government says, if you don't pay your land rates, then you have a problem. Your, the house might even be brought down. So actually who owns that house? So that one translates to what it's called ownership in intellectual property or even ownership in law. So ownership is the exclusive uh, 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 title that an individual, uh, could you kindly comment? I, I would want that question kindly. Uh, the, so ownership is the exclusivity that someone has over something, the exclusivity that you have over something that you don't need to ask anyone. So that is ownership. Most of us, and I've interacted with a few, uh, a few writers, <laughs> let me not call them authors. I've interacted with a few writers. I, I have a book here, I wouldn't want to. Uh, there's, there, there's a day someone came at it. How many pages? I'm working on my first book, you got 298 pages. No, that's laziness, I don't read laziness. <laughs> Of course, it was a joke, but I said I don't. 98 pages, you need introduction. For me, a book that I would read, that is just introduction. Anyway, that is me. Sasa, majority of us, when we have a manuscript, who owns that manuscript? The copyright will be written Magnus. That's what majority of us do. So we attach the copyright on the person Magnus. Why? Because Magnus has built it. To that extent, it limits what Magnus can do with that manuscript. If you look at majority of the books that we read, those books were converted into their own companies. I don't know if you have noticed that. I don't know if you noticed that Rich Dad, Poor Dad is owned by Rich Dad International. Have you, uh, do you know that? It's not owned by Robert Kiyosaki. I don't know if you've noticed that. There's, there's another book I love so much. It's called uh, uh, this book, Emith, the Emith book. The Emith book is actually written by a gentleman called Michael E. Gaba. But Michael does not own Emith. He's the author of that book, but he does not own that book. That book is owned by Emith International. So the first point of owning any manuscript is for every author, particularly in this time, to consider converting your manuscript into its own company. Because when you convert it into its own company, guess what? 
I will die someday and God forbid, but I will die someday. You are going to die someday. At some point, the limit of copyright in Kenya is 70 years. That's the limit of copyright in Kenya. After you have died for 70 years and for your one of your uh, uh, kings that you will have assigned to own, after they have died also, I think it's also for another 25 years, that book goes to the public. <laughs> and that is what the people in the US, they know that us guys, we don't know. So if Michael E. Gaba dies today, that book will constantly form part of what it's called the Michael E. Gaba estate. So your product and your works, they become part of your revenue generating models in perpetuity. That phrase perpetuity is not a big word. <laughs> it's where when we are praying, we say forever and ever. The phrase perpetuity simply means forever and ever. It is high time in order for us to begin to grow value in our books. Actually, there are books in Kenya today that ought to be, have, to be converted into companies. And those companies can even be listed at the stock exchange. But if your book is just owned by Magnus, guess what? You have hampered what you can do with that book. So the first point, if you really appreciate the extent to which this book can go, if you're really con uh, very confident and comfortable with what you have put out in that book, the most important thing is to convert that book into its own entity at law. That book becomes distinct from you. Today, if you read a lot of uh, the Michael Jackson estate, what forms part of the Michael Jackson estate? The something, something ranch, right? Today, they are putting Michael Jackson estate to be worth a billion shillings, uh, a billion dollars, the Michael Jackson estate. What forms part of the Michael Jackson estate? His music, his dresses, those uh, uh, gloves are part of the Michael Jackson estate. The dance move, the choreography are part of the Michael Jackson estate. So in order for us to unlock the things that will actually create business and the things that will actually take our ventures to the next level, it is high time every author divorced their books from themselves. It doesn't matter. Whether it's your academic project, divorce it from yourself and then it can do something out there effortlessly. What I always say in my classes is this, Intellectual property is the only form of resource that can go to work on your behalf. On your behalf, intellectual property. So Magnus, on the short of it, is one to begin from that. Majority of people will always tell you that, hey, uh, go register for a copyright. I will never ask anyone to go register for a copyright. Why? Copyright is one of those misunderstood things that people don't even understand. The moment you start to do something, copyright has already kicked. <laughs> copyright has already kicked. So copyright does not do anything that you don't understand. And we have people walking around with music copyrights, people walking along with books, copyrights that they own that they cannot even activate. I wouldn't ask us that ownership is copyright. No, ownership is on what you own and understanding to what dimension then do you own it? That is the most important thing. Even if you have 15 titles, you can actually consider registering those 15 titles into their own independent companies. If money is a problem, then consider just setting them, the, them up as a business name. In Kenya today, a business name is 1,200 shillings, setting up a business name. And so those business names become their own individual entities. That today, if someone asks you, what is your estate? You say, uh, my estate is made up of five companies. Five companies? What are those companies? Oh, I wrote this book. That book was converted into its own company. I wrote this other book. It was converted into, into its own company. The reason why I'm saying that is this. Every idea has its own lifestyle. If you've written a book, that book has its own lifestyle. That lifestyle 
only gets triggered the moment that book gets divorced from your person. That is the shot that I would actually uh, 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 answer Magnus. The other question was asked by a lady called Naomi. And Naomi is writing a book without characters. <laughs> that ought to be a very strange book. At I example. <laughs> I, I can explain what I mean. The book. <laughs> Let me please explain what I mean. The book doesn't have characters. <laughs> so that you don't think it's some ghosts I'm writing about. So the book is called A Thousand Useful French Expressions. So I am a French teacher, like you know, Guan. And I am looking at the challenge I have seen in the market, which I want to exploit, is people speaking French correctly. So people would always drop out, start learning French and drop out because the, the, the system has been unable to make them speak French uh, well and speak very well, something I'm very passionate about as a teacher of French. So this book is for the busy Kenyan, the, the average busy professional who's busy Monday to Saturday. Sun, they have no time for my classes because I run a company that teaches French virtually. So this book ideally is 1000 useful French expressions. And we are going to record all these expressions in a studio. This will be something they can play to work as they're going to work, they're listening to the 1000 useful French expressions. By the time they're done with book one, we go to book two. So it is just expressions, there are no people inside. So that's what I mean. Like the first, let me give you the, the first expression in that book is bonjour, which means good morning or hello. So that's what I mean. It doesn't have characters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that explanation. I, I was like, Jesus, how, how would someone write things without, <laughs> without characters? You know, actually, in, in English, character actually means uh, syllables. Eh? <laughs> so, but I understand what you, 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 you mean. Now, thank you for that. The beautiful thing with language is how language is segmented. Uh, particularly if you're learning English, English is segmented, but the English that is segmented is, uh, is to the extent of the exposure or level of access that we all have. I've always said, uh, I don't speak pedestrian English. You know, those English with the useless uh, in, in notations of you know, you know those uh, those uh, they are called what upsides. You, you know, like uh, like I was saying, like you know, they are no. Th that is for someone who is demented. I speak academic English. I don't speak pedestrian English. Uh, so English equally is segmented. If you go to doctors, people in the medical space, they have their own English right? And that English is segmented that way. If you go to people in the political space, they also have political English or what is called diplomatic English. Diplomatic English might mean something different entirely. If you are in the military space, they also have their own English. There are thousand useful French expressions as at on the face value is merely generic. So to that extent, you have not zeroed in on the aspect of crafting an industry for yourself. That if I was to craft an industry for let's say an executive, let's, let's say who, 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 who is interested in uh, Francophone countries. Now we have the, 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 the CEO of uh, Equity Bank and equity is actually getting into Francophone countries. What do you think is the level of English he needs to exhibit and to actually have influence in that space? He has very little interest in bonjour, right? Bonjour is for an idiot who wants to pick up a lady. At his level, he's requiring a level of performance. So to that extent, you have not yet, according to what the little that you have shared with us, you have not yet framed for a particular audience. And if you can frame for a particular audience, then you tailor it around that particular audience. How would a CEO, for instance, 
want to sound in French, right? So let's say, bonjour. And someone says, bonjour, bonjour. So which of the, those two is actually French? In as much as what you're putting together might not have characters, but what you're putting together is of a lot of importance in intonation because that intonation will either correspond well with your target audience. To that extent, you own even the intonation of bonjour, bonjour, or bonjour, bonjour. So if I say bonjour, I end up sounding like, <laughs> I don't want to say that word. <laughs> I hope it's clear. You will own it, Naomi, you will own it to the extent that you structure it around your target audience and what is the need of your target audience. Have you ever seen a, a judge who shouts? You will never see a judge who shouts. Why? Because in the legal practice, authority is not in, no, the legal authority is in, sit down, sit down. And guess what? Do you know there is, there is a level of participation in the legal space where people are actually trained on how to enunciate certain words. Why? Because your enunciation will either go with your role or your enunciation will say that, boy, Nicole, man. <laughs> is a police. <laughs> oh, boy, Nicole, man. So Naomi, that is how I would go about it. I would go about it like if, 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 and this is a, 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 a brilliant example. There's a lady who was called Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher uh, at some point was the premier of, 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 of UK. And, and Margaret Thatcher, when she was a member of parliament back in the days, she would shrill a lot. Her voice was very annoying. The day Margaret Thatcher said that she wanted to vie for, 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 for the premier of UK, guess what? The Labour Party had to get for her a speech tutor to bring her voice one semitone lower. One semitone lower, why? Because they said it would be an embarrassment for the UK premier to shrill. For a, a, a premier, UK premier to voice to shrill. So while she used to speak like this, Mr. Speaker, sir, this is what you're trying to sell this house. When, her, when she became the premier, she had to go one semitone lower. If you want to check it out, you can check out some of Martha uh, Margaret Thatcher's video online, videos online. And that is the, 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 the specific audience that you're speaking to will actually determine what would go with that specific role. Like, have you ever seen a weightlifter with a small voice? Like, 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 Nico, if I love the voice, you know, you, you, you're like a joke. So I hope that makes sense. In as much as there are no characters, a huge part of what you're selling is the packaging that fits that role. Lucy. Lucy is a writer or she's an author. <laughs> Lucy is a writer and she's an author. And Lucy has come up with a book that is called The Unbeatable Spirit. The Unbeatable Spirit. And of course, <laughs> I wouldn't want to... Lucy asked. <laughs> she has been working on the cover. Again, please don't take offense. I laugh a lot. This is purely for illustration purpose. So Lucy says that she has been working on, on, on this cover for a while. And, and uh, the question was, do you think Niendele Amani stop with, with, with the no. process? No. Okay. I did, I, no, I don't. This, maybe I can, I, can, I can reframe so that you get the question properly. Is that okay? Kindly, please. Yes, what I was saying is that the book is, the book is complete. The cover is done. All right. But remember, there's a place you said that one needs to be able, okay, it's, it's like the, okay, I have written a book, Alafu, you know, so I am, I have already de designed the Alafu there after the book thing or what it is that I want to do with that book thereafter. 
And one of the things that I want to do with that book is because I am a speaker, I want to be able to use, to, to frame it and to use it as part of my speaking career. But above, and in, in framing that speaking and coaching, because I'm also a coach, I have come up with a brand and my brand is called The Unbeatable Spirit with Lucy, right? And this, The Unbeatable Spirit with Lucy brand has its, has its colors. I have already designed the brand colors and what they mean for me and what, what they represent. What I meant is that whereas the brand color for me for The Unbeatable Spirit with Lucy is clear, it does not, it's not the same as the, as the color of the book or the book cover. So I was asking myself, should I, should I redesign the cover so that then it, it sort of uh, aligns with the brand, with the brand colors or it's okay to proceed as, as has been developed anyway, even if there's a distinction between my brand colors as the Unbeatable Spirit with Lucy from what the book is. Thank you so you get much. It. Yes, yes, I have gotten it now. There's something that happens when you talk for two hours. Sometimes uh, people say, say things and it's like, now Lucy, I've gotten it. My question, I, I want to talk like my, my, my Lord Jesus. I want to answer you by asking you a question. Uh, if you were to give a lifespan for that book, how long do you think the lifespan of that book would go? Because what I'd said, you remember what I'd said earlier, that whenever we are dealing with ideas, every idea has its own life, life, uh, life form. I say that. So every book equally has its own life form. Where most of us we have never known is that every book equally has its own lifespan. And that is where majority of us, we come short. A book is just like a baby. The moment someone conceives from that day that you start puking, you go for these regular checks. And the regular checks are set down, laid down with specific milestones. So which means we want you to come here next month and the next month, we want to see where the baby has positioned itself. Next month, we want to see is the baby growing limbs. Next month, is the baby growing nose. Next month is the baby growing hair. So that is a lifespan. So after the baby is born, actually, then that baby is equally put on other injections and injections and immunization. Those are lifespans, particular lifespans with very specific, uh, 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 what is it called? Uh, milestones. Where most of us we have is we are building a book without an awareness of what is the lifespan of my book. I would want that we read, for instance, I, and this is where now I'm telling Lucy uh, from my heart, I would want you to take study one character or study one author, one author, and, and see how that author dealt with a book. And that one in a huge way will go in informing us, is my, is my cover as at now, do I consider it as, 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 as stable or do I consider it weak? Nine out of 10, what I advise most musician is, whenever you're putting together a song, that song is not necessarily yours. That song is supposed to be listened to by other people. So as we are trying to look, and we might not actually get it 10 out of 10. Sometimes we get it nine out of 10. Sometimes we get it two out of 10. It's all a process of trial and error. But the most important thing is, is there an immovability component in my book that my book is solely solid? If you look at uh, books like, uh, the, the, uh, when I was doing my law degree in Uganda, uh, in Uganda, they don't regard you as learned if, you're not, if you have not done Shakespeare. So when I was in Uganda, I was asked to do 120 works of Shakespeare. And you would see how that guy structures his plays, how he structures his tra uh, tragedies, how he structures his comedies. And, and, and that is a beautiful thing in us. So that one informs how far the book will go. That one informs the connectivity, the, the connectivity aspect with the book. But 
But on a matter of principle, on a matter of principle, particularly when you're framing the cover part, uh, the, the cover part of the book, nine out of 10, a book is its cover. Nine, excuse me, nine out of 10, a book is its cover. You will go somewhere and look at the appeal component of the book. And even more importantly, there's a day I was listening to T.D. Jakes and he said he's a best selling author. So which means selling comes first before an author. So if you are to approach your book as a company product and you are the sales manager of that company product, the component would be this. How would people connect, for instance, with the title of the book? Is the title of the book, is it solid from what I feel? Or if I was to tweak the title of the book, because sometimes we tweak the, the title so, so, so plainly that I only really know what you're going to say about in that book. A book like, there is a, a, a gentleman called Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel did an amazing book. He, he did a book called From Zero to One. <laughs> you know, From Zero to One. That book actually leaves you with this, uh, what is it called? Uh, I, I would want curiosity. I would want to read that book. There's another book. Uh, I, I read some, 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 some lady gave me a book from something to scars. You know, that book even defies poetic justice. For those of us who like poetic justice, that book defies poetic justice from something to scars, from scars to stars, yes. From scars to stars. You know, that book, even on its own page, this is someone who went through a problem. I don't care. I also, I'm also going through my own problem. The, I, I'm not saying that, uh, Lucy, that, that that is what your book means. But I'm, I'm trying to say that there is an aspect of poetry, there's an aspect of creativity that makes books to sell at the appeal level. And a huge part of that appeal level is, can we do, for instance, research? If you were to go out and they just ask people at random, hey, we're trying to put together a book of these two titles, which one do you think gravitates well with you? And someone will say, um, the unbeatable spirit, uh, and this is the unbeatable spirit with Lucy. Yes, so what's the difference? It's just the unbeatable spirit, okay. So that is how you would come up and arrive at certain decision-making processes. Because nine out of 10, you are packaging your story, you're packaging your knowledge. Guess what? In that story, Lucy, in that story, there is just a premise that you're selling. And that premise that you're selling, nine out of 10 is the knowledge of the book. So how do I package that premise that I'm selling? So if I was to advise, I would rather measure something nine times and cut once than to cut something nine times and measure once. Because when we cut something nine times, we waste resources, we waste time, we waste opportunities. But if you were to, if I was to advise you, I would actually advise you to go out there, conduct research. Talk to total strangers. Don't talk to your people, people who know you. They might not want to hurt your feelings. But meet people who are ruthless, people who don't care like me. Then we'll tell you, ah, by the he, he, apana, he, he. So reach out to people, talk to people. Hey, I'm trying to put together a book. This book is talking about this. Of these two, which one would you like? And someone would say, uh, uh. so sometimes even three options. Because what? Lucy, you're putting something into the universe that is meant to transcend your time. And if you're, it's supposed to transcend your time, you're supposed to think about it. Have you read the spirit of Napoleon Hill when he was coming up with that title, Think and Grow Rich? Do you know how many other titles he came up with? How many other titles were, uh, were shut down, shot down by people just so that you get it right ones. And if you can get it right ones, it will take you for the rest of your life. And so uh, I want to, th there's a, a gentleman, there's someone else who asked something about poem and, and I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, Patricia, there's a question about poem. And then there was another question about uh, article, something, something of the constitution of copyright. Okay, so Vera, Vera is asking, or oh, Melvin is asking, do you have a Kenyan example of a single poem 
or short story whose value was deliberately unlocked by the creator. And then there was a question by Vera also. And Vera is asking what, and what would you advise in the case of an author having many titles of a book? And then she asked, would you kindly comment on the legal system in Kenya in the light of intellectual property? How easy is it, for instance, to sue for infringement? Uh, Lawrence is asking, in newspaper articles, does copyright belong to the writer or the publishing media house? May I, may, may I answer? Yeah, continue. Uh, I, I would want to start with the, the last one. I would like to start with article of uh, in newspapers in Kenya, where uh, we, we, we write, so some of us, we, we, we are contributors, we are columnists, sometimes uh, they just tell you, hey, nyaji, nyaji, sukuna ile kitu all right, hey, buni patika kitu mazeni print kesho. <laughs> and so to, to that extent, who, who owns the copyright? The copyright is owned by the person who originated that thing. So in as much as I might have signed something, some of these things that they give people to sign, <laughs> anyway, I'll not go into that, but you might sign something purporting to have given it away. So let me ask you. So I have a story and, and I want to, I, I would want uh, NT, uh, news, nation newspaper to print it, uh, right? I wouldn't say publish. I would want nation newspapers to print it. Actually, newspapers are printed, they're not published. So I want nation newspaper to print. So to what extent does the nation own? Because nation has printed that work. We had said earlier, then when it comes to the academic definition of intellectual property, nation will actually acknowledge you as the writer of that thing and actually they will give up space for your face and your name and what you do and sometimes even your email address so to that extent nation is actually acknowledging your your title over that story nation cannot if nation owned the copyright then nation would twist that story and reprint it again but they cannot do that why because that title is yours so whether you are printing, whether you are a columnist, or you are some of these people like, hey, hey, nyeje, nyeje, unazen, pati, like, ni print. whether you are that, the thing is this, they acknowledge you as the writer. They will never do anything with that story. The moment they do something with that story that they don't actually tell you to that extent, you can take action against them. But the copyright never moves with, from, from the, the original contributor. The origin, the person that has come up with the story. Copyright is yours and copyright exists on you, on you. And then there was a question about the legal system uh, in Kenya of, of, of IP. One of those uh, misunderstood areas of, of legal practice in Kenya is intellectual property. And it's, 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 it's funny because uh, the level of ignorance on the person bearing IP and the person infringing the IP. <laughs> so the level of ignorance that we, we come across, particularly in the marketplace for people who own intellectual property. Let me give you a typical example. Two weeks ago, two, I think a month ago, Machakos High Court awarded a border border rider Two million shillings and they were claiming that um, Rafiki microfinance bank had actually used his image without his knowledge so uh, high court uh, arrived at two million shillings my question was what was the right that was actually infringed in on that basis 
because guess what it is the court uh, it is actually a uh, family uh, um, rafiki that took the photo <laughs> it's actually rafiki that actually designed the photo it's actually rafiki that developed the photo and rafiki that actually paid for the billboard so my question was as an intellectual property practitioner what market did this rider create from his face nothing as a matter of fact that just by putting that image they have actually made the guy popular in, in machacos but guess what <laughs> you you don't understand some of these decisions that are made so the intellectual property the system of intellectual property at the point of you can claim excuse me at the point that you can say so and so is infringing on my right right as that now depends largely on awareness what right is being infringed uh, infringed upon and what is the extent of that right that is being infringed upon so if you can actually show that this right is being infringed upon a typical example again in 2016 2017 uh, uh disney went ahead and they trademarked hakuna matata you remember that story hakuna matata hakuna matata the person who sits at the board of Kenya Copyrights Board, one of the guys is called Ngala. Ngala is actually the musician who sang that song <laughs> in the 1980s. Jambo, Jambo Buana, the guy who sang that song was Ngala. Ngala sits at Kenya Copyrights Board. You want to tell me Ngala did not know that Hakuna Matata was actually proprietary? So that is the scenarios that we find ourselves in in kenya whereby the people that are bring, bringing cause and the people that the causes are brought against them are purely ignorant and that is why disney trademarked hakuna matata that is why disney trademarked simba <laughs> simba has been trademarked by disney you want to tell me even us guys did not know our attorney generals did not know so that is the level of ignorance that we have in the country. The most beautiful thing in your career right now as we speak is for you to identify intellectual property in anything and everything you're doing and for you to make room for performance on intellectual property. Then Melvin had asked, do I have any Kenyan story that the author did something deliberate with it? There's a gentleman called Professor Walla Bin Walla. Walla Bin Walla has, has been writing some books. I don't know if Melvin knows the check that Walla Bin Walla gets from Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development annually. <laughs> Ridiculous amount. But guess what? Walla has not even exploited fully what he can do with his intellectual property. The part that Walla has been doing is that Walla has managed to license part of his manuscript for Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development to adopt as an area of instruction. That is one of the ways, one of the low hanging fruit ways whereby most of us, we can actually maximize on our intellectual property. Number quick, full stop, Apple. I will actually share the, 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 the notes with, uh, with, with, with Patricia. And I want to really thank you so much for your time. I really want to wish to thank you. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it, it's gone overboard up to 4.30. I, I really apologize. Just in case you've been interacting with my face for the very first time. My name is Mr. Oguang, Mr. Oguang Omuga. And I'm the principal of INS at Institute of Intangible Resource Awareness. Uh, this in, uh, intangible resource awareness, this institute is actually a subsidiary to our law firm that is called Chuero and Company Advocates. We exclusively deal in intellectual property. Ukichapwa na bibiako, I'm not interested. Ukichapwa na buwana, I am not interested. Ukitaka kununua shamba, I am not interested. The only thing that interests us in our practice is intellectual property. I want to thank so much uh the guild for having facilitated created for this avenue so that we can learn on intellectual property i might not know everything actually i think i know only one percent of intellectual property so together when we learn 
we build capacities and we unlock our own industries. Thank you for the engagement. Thank you for Kuka for two hours and 25 minutes just listening to someone talk. I really want to hope that you've derived a lot of value. Patricia, Nomba Nikurudishie Usukani with a, a lot of thanks for you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for attending this session and thank you for creating time to actually sit through all the two hours and 30 minutes listening to this valuable information. I'm very sure we are not, uh, we have had enough knowledge that will help us. But this is just, we have just started a conversation. So we want to create um, sort of a workshop, sort of a group, I'll say. So if you're interested to know much more about this, I have your emails. I'm going to send you details on how you can join now a particular group that you learn more. You learn how to, okay, okay, I've seen it. Um, I look for it actually. Uh, those people who have not sent the emails, feel free to send the emails uh, because I'm going to share all the information on how we'll be now. If you want to move and learn more, want to inquire more about um, intellectual property, we are going to move to another stage now. This is going to be a very private stage where we are going to learn together. And uh, Mr. Omuga will be here to help us all step of the way. We'll just share the details of how you can join the group and how you can join this. So it will be such like a process. I can't call it a course. I'll call it a, a program, a small program that we are going to learn together and we are going to um, explore more on intellectual property. So thank you so much for coming. But I've, just as, as I've said, this is just the starting point. We have so much to learn. We have so much to explore. So do not be quiet. If you don't receive an email, please uh, go to Writers Guild, whether Facebook page, uh, in the poster, we have an email address. Go through it and write or call us and let us know you want to uh, learn more about intellectual property and we'll connect you to the right group and you can learn more about it. Uh, for the Institute of Intangible Resources and Awareness and Mr. Omuga, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for creating your afternoon on a Saturday when people are resting to come here and share uh, this valuable information with us. And everybody who sat here, who came, who ignored watching the, the Olympics, who, who didn't want to watch the Netflix or just sleep because it's an, a nice afternoon, you can just sleep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And let's keep learning together. Let's keep explore, exploring and learning how we can benefit from uh, what we write out there. So Asante Sana, and you're going to hear from me. Thank you, Sana. Uh, you can you can continue sharing your emails, please, if you didn't register. I'll be here for some time sharing, just receiving the emails. So keep on sharing the emails. You can also write to me at write. I'm going to put an email down there. Should you need a recording, you can write to me. I'm putting an email down there. If you need the recording, you can write to me and uh, ask for it and I'll be, I'll be able to share with you. You are also allowed to live at your own pleasure and still here just checking the emails. <laughs> 